Corinthians chapter 6, if you would, please, this morning. Actually, 1 Corinthians 5, I apologize, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the Bible reads in verse 1, it is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. And ye are puffed up, and rather have not mourned, but he that hath done this deed, that he that hath done this deed might be taken uh, from away from among you. For I verily, as present, absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together in my spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, for as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. What have I to do, to do to judge them that are also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without God judgeth, Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. And what I want to preach tonight uh, is go through this, of course, very famous passage. And I want to start a series uh, on several of these sins here that are listed that would actually get you kicked out of church. Okay, and I think we're going to focus, obviously, first this morning on the first sin that's mentioned, which is fornication. And, you know, this doctrine of people being kicked out of church or, uh, as the Bible puts it, to be put out from among the congregation is a very important doctrine. You know, it's not something that we're totally unfamiliar with here at Faithful Word. This is something that we practice. It's something that uh, has, has gone on from the very uh, inception of this church. But it's something that we always need to keep in front of us because of the fact that we're living in a day when many other churches are downplaying this. And many other, you know, Christians, they don't believe this doctrine or they simply just don't understand it. And you'll even have people, when you preach this kind of, when you preach this doctrine or put this teaching out there, that will come back at you and say, well, this, this is unloving. You know, kicking people out of church, you know, that's so unchristlike. They'll say, you know, would Jesus do such a thing? You know, but the Bible's very clear here. I mean, these are the writings of the Apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that there are certain sins that God would say that if a person is found guilty of them, they are to be put out of the local church until they repent and, and get right, and then they should be allowed back in. But these people, you know, this is, uh, they'll, they'll claim, you know, this is so unchristlike, this is so unloving, how could you teach such a doctrine? But, and that's the reason why we need to kind of review these things and keep these things in front of us. Especially in a time that we're going through right now, uh, such as we are, where, you know, for the sake of, the sa- of, of safety and health of, of people in our congregation, we've gone to a live stream only. Uh, we've lim- severely limited the number of people that can come to the actual preaching service. You know, when people get in a situation like that, when they start, you know, they're, they're not in, uh, physically in church, and they're not, they're, they might have a tendency to backslide. They might have a tendency, well, maybe, uh, you know, the authority of the church somehow has been nullified during this time. Look, if, even in a time during, like, during such as we're in right now, going through this, this crisis, you know, these rules still apply. You know, God hasn't suspended his judgment. God hasn't suspended chastisement. God hasn't put the authority of the local church on hold. This is not a time for us to get lax. This is not a time for us to get loose in our Christian living. If anything, it's a time to tighten it up. It's time to walk even straighter than when we were before, to walk even in, a more, in holiness of, of, of life. Uh, not that we weren't to, before, but the danger is, is that during a time like this, people could begin to develop a very lax attitude towards the things of God. So I think that's why it's important. We, we should maybe take some time to remind ourselves of these things, the authority of the local church, and, you know, some specific sins that God, you know, calls out and says, look, these are worthy of being put out from the local church. And people will say things, you know, and if you would, keep something in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> for the, uh, this afternoon, but uh, we're going to be going, coming back there several times, but go over to John chapter 2, because that is the objection that we hear. It's like, oh, that's so unchristlike. Would Jesus do that? Well, actually, yeah, Jesus did kick people out of church. 
Jesus did run people out of the temple on more than one occasion. You know, if you'd read your Bible, you probably would under, you would know that without even me having to point it out. But if you look there in John 2, you know, you're, you're, you're just, you know, the second chapter into the book of John, you know, the gospel, uh, you see Jesus, you know, doing this very thing. And it says in verse 13, and the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drave them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And the disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest unto us, seeing thou doest these things? So it's interesting right there that the people that would criticize, uh, you know, enforcing a passage like 1 Corinthians 5, of teaching a doctrine of church discipline, the, the irony of them coming back and saying, oh, well, Jesus wouldn't do that, is that Jesus did do that. You know, and we're not instructed in the New Testament to sit down and, and make a, you know, basically, you know, make a scourge, make a small cord, you know, make a whip is basically what he's doing here. You know, and we, we, we read over these words, but think about what's being, uh, the, the, how the story plays out. Jesus goes there, he sees what's going on, and he doesn't just blow up in a rage. You know, he doesn't just lose his cool. He's not just, you know, lost his temper. This isn't him just being hot-headed. This is a very deliberate thing that Jesus did. This required, you know, intention and forethought. This is something that he took his time doing because of the fact we know that he, it says in verse 15, when he had made a scourge of small cords. He didn't have one on hand when he went there. He went, oh, I see what's going on here. Let me step back from the situation. Let me make this whip. I don't know how long it would take to make a scourge of small cords, but I can't imagine it's something, you know, as a matter of just pulling your shoelace off, and there you go. You probably have to sit down and do some braiding. You have to get the materials. So Jesus, this entire time, is thinking about what he's going to do, why he's going to do it, and then when it come, time comes, proceeds to go ahead and do it. So <clears throat> we see that, you know, Jesus, he did, in fact, practice this. You say, well, that's not the local church. Well, of course not, but it's a perfect example that there are certain things that God would run people out of his house over. You know, we're not instructed to do that. You know, you won't see any... Any, anybody, you know, any pastor, hopefully, I, I, that I know of, making a literal scourge of cords, you know, and chasing some fornicator out of the church. But all the same, you know, we have that authority. The pastors, the local church has that authority to execute and to carry out 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And in fact, a church that fails to do this, they're really the ones that are unloving. And we'll see here why in a minute. But I also want to point out there in John chapter 2, is notice who it is that's criticizing Jesus for doing this. You know, it wasn't his disciples. His disciples step back and go, oh, yeah, then they remembered the scripture. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They're saying, wow, he's zealous for the things of God. You know, they're being confirmed by this. They're being reminded of, of God's holiness and righteousness. And when we see church discipline take place, you know, that should be something we should reflect in the same way. When we see 1 Corinthians 5 carried out for any one of these sins that it lists, on, a, on somebody that we know, a, a fellow church member, you know, it should cause us to fear also, cause us to step back and remember, oh, yeah, you know, our pastor has zeal according to knowledge and should cause us to walk in, 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 a, in, a right, in a right way. But notice who the critics are. It's the unbelievers, right? It was the Jews. It was the Pharisees who are stepping back and saying, hey, who are you to do that? You know, and that's, and that, so who is, who's, what side of this story are you falling, uh, uh, which side are you coming down on in this story when you're going to start criticizing a pastor or attacking a man of God for carrying out clear instructions such as are found in 1 Corinthians 5. You're not coming down on the side of Jesus Christ. You're not coming down on the side of the disciples in the story. You're coming down on the side of the unbelieving Jews, those that would later attack and crucify the Lord. <clears throat> now, uh, that's, you know, that's the reason why we need to preach this, you know, for several reasons. One, because a lot of Christians, they don't believe it. They'll even go on the offensive and attack this doctrine, Simple, maybe be simply because they don't understand it, and they'll make outlandish claims and saying that it's unchristlike. Another reason we need to preach on these subjects, and this is all introduction leading into it, is that a lot of Christians understand this, they believe it, but they still don't take heed to it. And, they, and that's kind of the danger I feel like we might be going into with this, uh, you know, this temporary hold on, on, on church services, is that Christians, they could maybe not take heed to the warnings in the Word of God. 
and find themselves on the receiving end of this punishment if they're not careful. You know, they hear it preached, they, they, they hear it uh, read, they read it themselves, and yet Christians who still understand that this is the way it is, even in, you know, in this church, you know, many, there's been Christians, uh, even believers in this church that have seen other people suffer this uh, uh, church discipline, but then they still insist on doing it themselves and also are, are uh, you know, uh, are, are chastised in this way as well. So we need to be reminded of these things so that why? So that we take heed to this. So we don't allow these lukewarm and watered down churches and preachers, you know, cause us to get a lax attitude towards uh, church discipline and sin in our lives and, and, and then, or even just not taking heed uh, to, to what's being taught. Because here's the thing, it's important because of the fact that, you know, when you commit the specifically this sin that we're going to talk about today, uh, of fornication, it has grave consequences. <clears throat> it's, you know, that's why, this is something that we need to preach because of the fact that fornication has severe uh, consequences. I mean, think about being, uh, being kicked out of the local church. You know, that should strike fear into the heart of every believer. That should cause us to want to walk uprightly and to live right and to not suffer that. You know, if we have this flippant attitude, well, I, of church, if I could take it or leave it, you know, you're probably less likely to, to, to mind your P's and Q's or to, to keep yourself from sin. Now, I understand nobody's perfect, and, the, you know, the, the, the sins that are listed here are very specific. You know, we all have sin. We all mess up. But we're not all fornicators. You know, we're not all extortioners and drunkards and idolaters and covetous and so on and so forth. But we should always understand that if we do suffer these consequences, that, you know, these are grave consequences. These are not things to be taken lightly. You know, that being kicked out of church, that would be one of my worst fears. You know, I mean, to, to be, find myself outside of Faithful Word Baptist Church or any other church that has sound biblical preaching in it because quite frankly they're getting fewer and far between and harder to come by you know and not to mention the fact that you know that would be the that i you know whatsoever is bound on earth is bound in heaven you know if i'm being punished by the local church you know god's probably not too happy with me either so these things are serious and this is why we need to review these things we've probably all heard sermons on fornication and other these other topics but we have to keep these things in front of us we have to be reminded of them because of the grave consequences that come. I mean, look there, if you're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He says in verse 5, to deliver what such an one unto Satan. You know, it's not just, you know, you deliver you unto, your, you're not welcome at the potluck. You know, sorry, no Sunday, you know, no birthday donuts for you. That's not the punishment. Oh, so, you know, that is a form of punishment. Oh, you don't get to have any fellowship. It's not just that you're, you're not included in everything that's going on in a local church. You have been delivered unto Satan. For the destruction of the flesh. That's, that's frightening. Where God's just going to say, oh, my child's misbehaving. He's being kicked out of a local church and just kind of draw back his hand of protection and say, well, have at him. Teach him a lesson. <laughs> you know, this reminds me of, you know, this is kind of a, a, a side note here, but uh, especially with everything that's kind of going on with the, the, the coronavirus and everyone kind of being afraid of things and apprehensive and having all this anxiousness about what's going to happen or isn't going to happen and so on and so forth is we know ultimately behind all of this is it's satan that's behind it you know but i've all i've heard this illustration and i think it kind of ties in here what we're talking about is that you know satan is you know he he roameth, uh, roameth about as a as a as a as a lion seeking who may may devour you know he is a fearsome foe you know none of none of us can can stand up to him on our own you know, he will have his way with us. You know, he says of those that are, that, are, that are blinded by him, that he is taken, they are taken captive by him at his will. He's like a cat who just plays with the mouse before he kills it. I mean, he, he has great control over them. But you know, Satan, he is, he's like a, like a dog, you know, that's just, uh, just a rabid, ravenous dog that just wants to, you know, you ever see a dog that's just pulling at the leash, just barking, frothing? You know, think of these pit bulls or these, these other war breeds that are just, you know, want to get out there and to attack a stranger, attack somebody walking by. You know, you, you could just see it. These dogs are just hell-bent on, on maiming and mauling and destroying. That's kind of like the devil. You know, he's pulling at that leash. And I feel like so often, especially what's going on right now, so many Christians are looking at that dog. And they see the fangs and they see the drool and they see the fur up and they see the, the pawing at the ground and him wanting to get loose. And they're so afraid of that dog, but what they should be looking at is that who's at the other end of that leash. And who's at the other end of that leash is God. 
God's the one that's holding the devil back. So, while, you know, so rather than sitting there and fearing this, this mutt, ultimately, which is the devil, we should be fearing the one who has the control over that one. You know, we should be more afraid of being put out of the local church, not because we're going to miss out on what's going on, but because God's going to let a little slack out on that leash and let that dog get a little closer and, you know, let Satan get a little closer. And he just might take a bite at you if that's the case. So that's really why we need to preach about these things. Because if we find ourselves on the receiving end of church discipline, we have to understand the consequences are grave. They are not to be taken lightly. And God doesn't, you know, he, he, of course, in 1 Corinthians 5, and I believe there's other instances we'll, we'll talk about later where church discipline comes into play that's outside of these specific sins. I don't want to get ahead of myself there, but 1 Corinthians chapter 5 is limiting itself here to some very specific sins, right? And that should show us that, you know, God doesn't just, God isn't just picking sins out of, at, at random. God's not just sitting here, oh, man, I got, he got to 1 Corinthians 5 and, like, uh, what are some things we should uh, punish people for? Oh, I don't know. I mean, he names these sins for very specific reasons. And I believe he starts out with fornication because it has severe consequences uh, to those that practice it. So that's what I want to talk about this morning. This is kind of all introduction, but we'll, we'll, we'll move here through it this a little quicker. But, <laughs> you know, I want to talk about specifically one of the sins that's going to get you kicked out, which is fornication. And I've entitled the sermon this morning, Get Right or Get Out Fornication. Okay, So there's several sins here that you either need to get right, get out of your life, or get out of church. That's, that is a biblical doctrine. And the first one on God's list here is fornication. Now, why is that? Is that because God just couldn't come up with anything else? Is that just because God felt like that was a good one to pick on? Or is it because fornication in and of itself has severe consequences that come with it. You know, despite what Hollywood and the mainstream media and, and everyone's putting out there, you know, uh, with all their movies and things, of people going to the bedroom together outside of marriage and them just being happy and in love, you know, fornication has some very serious consequences that come with it. And I know the world, through their ungodly methods, have ways to try to nullify some of these consequences. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you play that game long enough, you are going to suffer negative consequences one way or another, be it physically or spiritually, you're going to suffer. If you look there in 1 Corinthians, go to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, <coughs> excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, the Bible says, flee fornication. Flee it. He didn't say, you know, uh, see how close you can get to, to it and not actually go, uh, and go there. He didn't say, you know, flirt with it. He said, flee it. Be, be like Joseph, you know, when, when uh, Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. You know, he didn't just, you know, oh, no, no. I mean, he, he got out of there. He left his coat behind. He was trying to get out of there so bad. And said, keep the garment. I'm out of here. You know, and he ran out of the room. That should be the attitude that we have towards this sin. You know, if we're a single person in the room tonight and we ever find ourselves in a, in a position where, you know, we're being propositioned or the temptation to commit the sin is there, you need to flee that. You need to run screaming in the other direction. Because if you hang around long enough, that kind of thing begins to wear you down. It'll begin to wear you down. People don't just wake up one day and fall into this sin. I don't believe that. I believe people have been thinking about it, maybe looking at things they shouldn't have looked at, maybe uh, thinking about things they shouldn't be thinking about, and they have allowed themselves to be slowly just kind of lulled into this sin, and then once the opportunity comes, bam, they fall for it. They don't flee. You know, we should flee every appearance of fornication. We should flee things that are going to teach us to be fornicators or show us fornication, and especially the very act of fornication itself is something that should be run from by every one of us. It go, why? Because it says there, it goes on in verse 18, Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. He sinneth against his own body. What is he saying there? You're going to bring harm upon yourself even physically. You're, doing, you're not doing yourself. It might, you say, well, it's going to feel good, or you know, we, can, uh, you know, we have certain measures that we can take now to minimize the, the, the negative effects that come upon us physically. But either the Bible's true or it's not. You know, you're going to suffer physically from doing this. 
And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, you know, maybe uh, in verse 8, it says, Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed, talking about Old Testament Israel and their, and their wanderings, uh, and fell in one day three and 20,000. Now, do you think they fell because they all contracted some deadly uh, STD? No, it's because God went and slew them. Because God went through the camp and killed them. You know, so you might be able to, you know, through all these ungodly means and things like that, to try to minimize these effects with all the devices that man has come up with. But that's not going to stop God from reaching down and doing something. Show me what, what man-made invention is going to prevent God's chastisement. It doesn't exist. <clears throat> so we're, if we mess around with this sin of fornication, look, friend, it's only a matter of time before we bring harm upon our own body. <clears throat> Not to mention the fact that the fornication itself has its own built-in punishments. I mean, God sometimes with a lot of sins just has to sit back and let, let it take its course. Just let sin run its course, and it's got its own built-in punishment. And I believe fornication is a great example of that. You know, I don't want to go on and on with all the studies that, you know, and all the statistics that are out there. Uh, but, you know, STDs are on the rise. And they have been, they've been surging for five straight years, in, uh, five years in a row as of 2018, which is some of the most recent data that's available in the CDC. And it's stated that, that uh, uh, STDs such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, which are not things you want, which are not things that are easily gotten rid of. Some of these things are permanent. You can't get rid of them and have a terrible effects. And I've talked about them in other sermons. You know, people can literally go insane from some of these diseases. If it gets into the nervous system and, infects and get, you get an infection in the wrong place, I mean, it could cost you dearly. But these things, there's over 2.4 million cases of this in 2018 in America. There's 2.4 million cases, and the number rises every year. For the last five years, it's going up. You know, you might, and here's the thing, you know, uh, nobody's, nobody's that has this is, is putting a bell on themselves and, you know, covering their mouth and walking up and down the street and, and saying, unclean, unclean. You know, you wander into one of these nightclubs or bars or whatever and meet some, uh, you know, loose woman or some whoremonging man, uh, you know, you, just, you might just wind up with one of these. You know, they have already got it. They don't really, they might not even know they have it. They might not even care. They might be even so callous to think, well, you know, I've already got it. What does it matter? So, you know, there's 2.4 million people wandering around and, and more. I mean, this is just three of the potential diseases you could catch. Say, say nothing of HIV and herpes and all these other things that, that are out there. Do you, do you really want to roll the dice with your body that way? Do you really want to see if maybe, you know, uh, if you can go out there, you might, you know, roll those dice, it might come up snake eyes, you know, and you're going to end up, you know, permanently damaged for the rest of your life. So why are you preaching on this morning? Because there's grave consequences for this sin. God didn't just put it in there willy-nilly. You know, there's, there's spiritual consequences, there's God's chastisement, there's the chastisement of the local church, and not, to the fact, and not to mention the fact that if you get involved in the sin, you could bring it upon your own body and harm yourself with any one of these diseases. Think about uh, the fact that, you know, uh, uh, diseases like congenital uh, syphilis is on the rise, meaning newborns, children are be, being born with this disease. They're not even the ones that made this mistake. They're not even the ones... They went out and committed the sin, and yet they're the ones being born with some, uh, you know, STD at birth. This is on the rise in our country. You know, this is why these type of sermons need to be preached. This is why people need to give heed to this type of, of preaching because of the fact that we see these things on the rise. We should have no part uh, with, with this. What are some of the other uh, co severe consequences that come with fornication? We've talked about STDs. What about, how about this one? Maybe you won't contract an STD, but what if you end up having an unwanted pregnancy? Does that happen? Sure. I could tell you people I know in my past that happened to. And they went on to live very miserable lives. And that's, that child was not a source of joy. That child was not a, a delight to them. It was a burden. It was a, it was a source of heartache and pain because people, people get in that situation and they, they stop, you know, a lot of times they get together, they have their fun, she ends up pregnant, right? And then she runs off to go, you know, take care of this kid on her own and leaves dad in the dust. Or he says, oh, I don't want anything to do with this kid. That was, you know, I didn't mean to have him. Too bad, honey, you're out on your own. 
You know, these aren't, you know, people that typically get involved in the sin, they're doing it for selfish reasons. They just want to gratify their own flesh. They just want to, you know, t- uh, uh, you know, gratify that lust that they have in their hearts. They're not interested in taking care of that person or raising a child or starting a family. They're not interested in that. So when that happens, when that unwanted pregnancy comes along, they just assume that you go ahead and, and go live your life on your own and raise that child on your own or you can't have any part in this child's life. That's the type of thing that happens. And what it leads to is people who just look at their children. I, I, I can just think of scores of people that I've worked with or known over the years that just view their children as nothing more than a financial burden. They just say, oh, well, you know, I've got to pay child support for the rest of my life for this kid. And you know what? Often they don't even get to see him. They don't get to play a significant role in their life, but they've got to pay for it. And they, I don't ever want my children to be that. Now, are children a financial burden? Of course. But when you've intended to have those children... When those children are bringing joy and delight, believe me, friend, it's worth the investment. And that's a, that's a burden I'm more than willing to bear it, because of all the return that you get from it. It's worth it. What about the fact that these unwatered pregnancies often lead to abortion? Often lead to just innocent blood being shed in this land to the tune of 3,000 babies a day when you average it out. You know, and that's innocent blood that God is going to hold us accountable for. Even if it all stopped today, you know, it, it's too late. We, that, all that, there's just a pool of blood that still, has, that still cries out from the ground, and God hears. So we see that, you know, I mean, can you imagine that? Can you imagine being, uh, you know, a young man who just goes out and commits this sin with some, uh, some loose girl, some floozy. She gets pregnant, and you find out about it, and she says, well, you know what, I'm going to go have an abortion. You can't do anything about it. Your own, your own child is just going to be butchered in the womb. <clears throat> so these are the severe consequences that come with fornication. Can we begin to understand now why God says, kick the fornicator out? He's not welcome. You better go get it right. That God, when he says that the, the, the fornicator is going to be delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, God doesn't want these type of things taking place. Not to mention the fact that if you, maybe, you, maybe you'll skate by. Maybe you won't catch some disease. Maybe you, know, you won't have some unwanted pregnancy. But do you really want to be lumped in as a fornicator with all these unwicked, other wicked people? Do you really want to be known as the guy who's a fornicator? I mean, let's go over to, go over to Rome, Romans chapter 1, right? <laughs> Everyone gets excited when you, when you say Romans 1, right? Romans chapter 1. I mean, what's, what, you know, fornicator is a wicked person. The Bible makes it very clear it's a very wicked sin, and it's practiced by wicked people. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 28. It says, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to reprobate mind. So who are we talking about here? We're talking about reprobates, people who God has given over to do the most vile, uh, filthy, disgusting, uh, imaginable acts that are out there. And, 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 uh, and, and God goes on here and says, They're doing those things which are not convenient. And what are these type of people filled with? They're filled with all unrighteousness and what else? Fornication. Is that the type of people you want to get lumped in? Now, I'm not saying if you're committing fornication, you're a reprobate. You know, that, a fornication is at least a, a, a sin that is common to man. These people, however, have been given over to a complete repro- reprobate mind, do those things which are not convenient, meaning they do, they do those things which, you know, sins which are not common to man because of the fact that God has turned them over to give them the heart of a beast. But do you want to be lumped in with that? To be guilty of some of the same sins that people that are this vile and disgusting have been given over to? Fornication? I mean, it's right there. It's the second thing he lists. Unrighteousness and fornication. Go ahead and turn back to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5 if you kept something there. I'll remind, actually, you know what? Go to Jude chapter 1. Let's go there and look at it. You know, maybe you won't catch the disease. You know, maybe, maybe uh, the odds will be in your favor. Maybe. Maybe, you know, you won't have the unwanted pregnancy. But what about just being lumped in together with these people? When you're, when you're found out, when you're cast out of the local church, when your reputation is ruined, when you're known as a fornicator, do you want that? I mean, you're being lumped in with the very wicked people. Look here in Jude chapter 1. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah, now we all know what, they, what, what, what Sodom was guilty of and, and the wickedness that they practiced, and the cities about them in like manner, giving, giving themselves over to fornication. See, we always like to, Focus in on that, you know, the act of sodomy that they were involved with, men with men, were doing that which is unseemly. 
right? But it says also that they were given over to fornication. Because it says fornication and going after strange flesh. Look, they, they go both ways, folks. It's not that, I mean, it's anything that moves with these people, okay? I mean, is that who you want to be lumped in with? The sodomites who are given over to the same just, you know, lustful desires? Now, again, I'm not saying that that's going to make you, you know, a reprobate. But I'm saying you're practicing some of the same sins that these wicked, ungodly people are. are. You know, maybe that, that person you, you know, hook up with at the club, you know, you don't know who they've been with, how many different partners, how many other people they hooked up that week, that month, that year. You don't know how many that is. Maybe they hooked up with one of these people. Maybe they got together with some filthy, disgusting sodomite, and now you're hooking up with them. Uh, we don't want anything to do with this. this is a, that, that's why God calls this a very unclean thing. And churches need to preach this today. And, you know, we need to preach this here, not because it's not being preached, but because even when it is preached, people grow dull of hearing. And in a time like this, when, when, when things are seen, uh, you know, are uncharacteristic, when we're, when we're, we're staying home for the sake of, uh, and safety of others, it, you know, people can get a very lax attitude. And, and, and what people can do is start to slip into these things. And I want to warn us tonight, or this afternoon rather, that, you know, fornication is something to be taken very seriously, and we should flee from it. <clears throat> we don't want to get lumped together. We don't want to suffer these severe consequences. Churches need to preach this. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Because a lot of times it's not just that churches aren't preaching this. I'm telling you, there's churches out there that are perfectly fine with you being a fornicator. They're saying, come on in, come as you are, and, and leave as you were. And they, they, have, they don't want you to change a thing. They'll, they'll, you can be a fornicating couple and have a Bible study in your home and, and, and be a, an example to others of how you live together outside of, uh, and are, are, are sleeping together outside of marriage, and they're perfectly fine with that. There's churches that, that are fine with that. You don't have to look very far. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. He says, your glorying is not good. I mean, that's what was going on in 1 Corinthians. That's why he had to write that, or excuse me, at the church of, of, the, of Corinth and the Corinthian people. He had to write this because of the fact that they weren't doing anything about it. I mean, that's why he's sitting here admonishing them, saying, Get, you know, put, them, put them out from you. Put away that wicked person. I mean, if they were taking care of business, Paul wouldn't have to be. And that's the same situation we find ourselves in today. A lot of churches that are just glorying in it. They're, they're, they're just compliant. They're just fine with the fornicators in their church. They couldn't even, they, you know, kick somebody out, out of church for fornicating. <gasps> you know, gasp, how could you do such a thing? Well, because the Bible teaches us. And people need to hear this preaching. People need to be reminded of this, and they need to be made accountable to God. And let me say this, if you hear this type of preaching, if you're in a church like this, where this is being preached, where this is being practiced, where you know better, you are all the more accountable to God, not less. You know, the servant that knew his Lord's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes, as opposed to the servant who not, knew not his Lord's will and did it not, who shall be beaten with few stripes. They're both beaten, friend, but the person who knows more, unto whom so much is given uh, of him shall also much be required. If we understand these things and know these things, we should be um, even more afraid to cross God and to break uh, these commandments. And too many, day, too many churches today, they neglect to preach this. They neglect to practice this, uh, this doctrine of, of church discipline. And they say things like, well, you know, we're not under the law. We're under grace. They say, you know, uh, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 since you're right there, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. They'll say, hey, man, you know, that's all Old Testament. You know, God's not like that anymore. And I've heard it. I've heard it. You know, I've heard people preach this and, and talk about this and express this. Christians say, you know, hey, God's perfectly fine with what we're doing. And when it, when it, God's okay with us fornicating because, you know what, it's as if we've never sinned. You know, the blood of Jesus covers it all. Yeah, that's true. You know what, you know, uh, God has forgiven us all our iniquities. You know, he, and, and if, if we're saved, we believe on Christ, we understand that God's not going to send us to hell for those sins. But go read Hebrews 12 and come back and tell me that God doesn't chase his children. Go read Hebrews 12 that, where God says he chasteneth every son whom he receiveth. And if you be without chastisement, then you are bastards and not sons. You know, God chastens his children. That's the point you want to get across this morning. 
Not that you need to stop fornicating and go to heaven, but you as a Christian need to not be involved in this sin so you don't suffer the consequences and so that God doesn't have to bring the hammer down in your life to get you to do right. <clears throat> but too many churches today, they just want to say, oh, well, God's not going to do anything about it. God's just this benevolent, you know, just, you know, absent-minded old man in the sky who's just not paying attention to what we do because we're saved. That's not the case. God is a thoughtful, uh, careful, and uh, you know, diligent father who's looking over the welfare of his children and desires that they walk in newness of life and is willing to do what it takes, as any decent father would, to get his children to do right. And if it means a beating, if it means a spanking, that's what he's going to do. Now, God's obviously not going to see some, you know, the hand, the hand of a man appear and, and literally give you a whipping. But God will call engineer circumstances in your life. God has given authority to the local church to enforce that. That, that chastisement that he brings. They'll say things like, oh, you know, well, we're all things to all men. It's okay for us to fornicate. It's okay for us to go in these bars and drink with these people because we're just trying to win them. You know, it's okay for me to go in the club and, you know, and, and, and go out there on the floor and do all these, you know, these, these, these lewd dances because, you know, we, we got to meet the people where they're at. You know, we got, we got to be, uh, you know, with them. You know, we got to be all things to all men. Well, what does it say in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21? He said, To them that are without the law is without, being not without the law to God, but under the law to Christ. You know, this isn't a license for you to just go out and live however you want. You know, salvation is not just, and people, we get criticized a lot for that, saying, oh, well, you, you teach people you can, they can live however they want and go to heaven. Yeah, that's true. That's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ did everything for us. But they, somehow they misconstrue that in their mind to where they think we're saying, oh, you can live however you want and not suffer any consequences. That's not what we're saying. We're saying you can live however you want because Jesus paid it all. He's the one that lived a perfect and sinless life, died for our sins, was buried again. We can live however we want and still go to heaven if our faith is in Christ. But we can still suffer the consequences of sin along the way. And in fact, we will. And in fact, because we are God's children, it's guaranteed if we want to disobey that we will suffer the consequences. Now, one of the, if you would, go over to Romans 8. I remember, and I've, I've shared this, I don't know if I've shared it here, but definitely down in Tucson, I've shared this story uh, from the pulpit before. But whenever I get on this topic, it always brings, and it always comes back into my mind. And I think it's a great uh, illustration and reality check of the fact that this is where a lot of churches are today. I remember first getting saved and going to this, you know, ecumenical Bible study, you know, that had a lot of younger people in it. And there was this one guy that I knew from junior high, high school, and, I, and he was a Christian. I didn't know that until I, I actually saw him there. But, uh, you know, and then there was this other girl that was coming, you know, and, and she's showing up in the tank tops and the short shorts, you know, just you know, it, there was no standards or anything like that. And uh, very slowly but surely, these two, you know, want, they're there, and then they're, you know, the next meeting they're here, and the next thing you know, they're walking around holding, and then you're seeing them out in public, you know, you know acting very inappropriately towards one another. And it became quite evident what was going on. And I actually had the, you know, the boldness to kind of go to this guy and say, hey, you know, the Bible says you shouldn't be doing that. The Bible says that's a sin. And, uh, and he says, well, I talked to my pastor about it. And you know what his pastor told him? His pastor didn't turn him over to 1 Corinthians 5, friend. That's not where he took him. He took him over to Romans chapter 8, and he read verse 1, part of verse 1. And this is what this guy expressed to me. He said, hey, there is, now there no for, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And that's where he stopped. That's where he stopped. That sounds pretty good if you're in that situation, doesn't it? Hey, pastor, you know, uh, I, I've got this girlfriend, and, you know, she, she wants to, you know, we, we want to fool around and mess around. Uh, is that okay? Well, you know, there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. You go right ahead. What a wicked doctrine. What a wicked thing to tell somebody when the reality is that, yeah, if you go ahead and do that, God's going to chasten you that you might end up suffering from an STD or an unwanted pregnancy, or God just might, you know, rain up and cloud on you. What a wicked thing to tell somebody. What a half-truth. What a lying prophet that guy is. And, you know, the rest, I didn't really have a good rebuttal at the time. I was pretty newly saved, but I went home and read it, looked up the verse, and it goes, it goes on there. Did you know that verse doesn't end there, buddy? Your pastor didn't bother telling you the, the latter half where it says, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, if you're saved and you want to walk after the flesh, you can mark it down that, you know, you're going to suffer for it. 
after the Spirit. You, gotta, you don't want any condemnation in your life. You don't want any judgment in your life. You don't want God to come down on you. Then you need to walk after the Spirit. And if you're going to walk after the Spirit, you're not going to be going running around committing fornication. <clears throat> so we can see why God, you know, he puts this on his list of sins that get people kicked out. Because it's a wicked sin that's practiced by wicked people. It has very severe consequences. And God doesn't want a church filled with diseases. And let me just come out and use a biblical term for you, bastards. Okay? And that's, not a, that's a harsh term to a lot of people today. That's the language the Bible uses. And if we got back to using some biblical language, people would be a little bit more careful. Because it used to be a shameful thing. It used to be something that you didn't go around you know, bragging about. It wasn't something that you know, churches, they had whole ministries to single mothers of bastards. And that's, you know, that's their big outreach. And they glorify the single mom. She should be ashamed. Not lifted up and praised. Oh, the, the hardest working person is the single mother. Give me a break. You know who the hardest person is? The woman who, who's, who's maintaining a marriage and a household and doing, all these th doing things the right way. That's who we should be lifting up. That's who we should be glorifying. Not these people who want to go out and just make a mess out of their lives and then suffer the consequences for it, and then we're all just supposed to break and have, our, have little broken hearts for them and just reach out to those poor little things. I'm not saying we shouldn't be out of compassion and people need to you know, be forgiven for the, the mistakes that they've made, but we need to preach these things so that those mistakes aren't even made in the, in the first place. And if you start using a word like bastard to describe your uh, unwanted pregnancy, you know, you'd probably be a little bit more careful not to have one. And then maybe you wouldn't have a child growing up without a father, growing up and becoming some kind of a derelict. I'm not saying, you know, that if there's people in, in the room, or I don't know everyone here, you know, if that's you, that you're without hope. You know, God, uh, God can still use any one of us, but the fact is God does not want his church filled with these people. He doesn't want fornicators running rampant and just, you know, causing all this disease, causing all this... Un I mean, what do you think was going to happen in First, in, in, excuse me, in First Corinthians? What do you think was going to go on in that church if Paul just was like, well, there's no condemnation in them which are in Christ Jesus? What if Paul had that attitude? I mean, the guy is sleeping with his mother-in-law. And, and then everybody else in the church is looking at it and go, oh, well, your Paul's okay with it. Oh, nothing, everything seems fine. That church would just be filled with all kinds of sin. That's why he said, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. <clears throat> and they tell them to purge that leaven out. You know, it's God's will that you do not fornicate. And if you would, turn over to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll wrap this up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Why does God you know, punish fornicators? Why does God have them kicked out of the local church? Because God doesn't want you fornicating. There are because of the consequences that come with it. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, you're going to 1 Thessalonians 4, but fornication and all uncleanness. He calls it uncleanness. And all uncleanness or covetous, not it let, not, let it not be once named among you. Not one time. Don't let it go on. Don't let it carry, uh, become a thing in your church. You know, don't become the church that's just okay with fornicators. He said, don't let it be named once among you as become the saints. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God. What's the will of God for my life? What does God want me to do? Uh, even your sanctification. And people get so worked up about finding out what it is what God wants them to do. You know, it's really not that much of a mystery. You know, God wants you to get the sin out of your life and keep yourself pure. That you should abstain from fornication. <clears throat> you're not in the will of God if you're committing fornication. Period. You're just not. You can't sit there and tell me that you know, God's pleased with you if you're a fornicator. <clears throat> you should abstain from it that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. There he is again, lumping them together with people that don't even know God. <clears throat> that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have also forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto cleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who get, hath given also, uh, also uh, given unto us the Holy Spirit, his Holy Spirit. So you get mad at the preacher, you get mad at the church that's practicing this and saying fornication's wrong, 
and that you should be kicked out of church for it. You know, you despise that person. You better be careful who it is you're really despising, is what he's saying here. You despise this teaching. You criticize it. You attack it. You call it on Christ-like. You call it on loving. You know who you're really attacking? You're despising God. That's who you're really despising. You're saying, oh, I don't like 1 Corinthians 5. Well, welcome to Christianity. Welcome to New Testament biblical preaching where you believe everything, where you can't just pick and choose what you like out of this book, where it's the whole thing or nothing else. It's the whole enchilada. That's what you get with Christianity, true Christianity. And if you've got a problem with it, you know, that's your problem is with God. It's not with me. It's not with the pastor. It's not with any preacher. It's not with any man of God. It's with God himself. That's what he's saying there. Read it again. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man. I can't believe that preacher. I can't believe that church. Look, you're not despising me. You're not despising this church. You're despising God. <clears throat> so you say, well, I don't want to be a fornicator. What are my options? You got two options. That's really it. You have two options. Marry or contain. Marry or contain. That's it. Those are your options. Not, well, you know, every so often I'm just going to go out and commit this sin. And then I'll get right and it'll be okay again. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> you have two options. If you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 7, I'll begin reading in verse 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. <clears throat> and let every woman have her own husband. There's your option right there. You know, and that's, that's, the, that's the option that 99% of people need to pursue in their life. Because we all have this God-given natural desire to, to, that those feelings that we have, those physical impulses are God-given. God gave us those. those they, they in and of themselves are not wicked. They're not bad. Those physiological impulses that we have are God-given. And God wants to satisfy those needs, but not through fornication. The only way that God allows us to satisfy that need is through marriage. And, and we can see why. Because if it's, you know, you want to cure all these STDs, you want to cure them overnight, you want to, you want them to see them just eradicated off the face of the earth, you want all these unwanted uh, pregnancies, you want all these abortions to end, how about, how about one man, one woman for life? I mean, you, you could cure it. I mean, other than the fact that they're letting the homos donate blood, I mean, that, they'd still leak over from there. That's another sermon, right? But here's the thing. You could, you could drastically cut it down. You know, there wouldn't be any problems. You know, if you got married and you had that, that, that need satisfied right there, you're, you know what? You're not going to have to worry about any of that. You're not going to have to worry about getting caught and kicked out or catching a disease or knocking somebody up. None of that. Those are our options to, uh, to uh, have our, every man his own wife and every woman her own husband. You know, rather than just satisfying our flesh through, you know, instant gratification, you know, we should be preparing and seeking for, we should be preparing for and seeking a spouse. Rather than, you know, just, you know, looking at things we shouldn't look at or going to places and hooking up with people that we shouldn't be hooking up with, you know, we should spend that time, you know, preparing ourselves for marriage, preparing ourselves for our spouse, you know, getting better at our job so that, well, you know, we can get married. If we're men, you know, we can get married and provide for the children that we have. Uh, you know, uh, women could be preparing to, to, to be a homemaker, learning skills, cooking, cleaning, the sewing. You know, I know that's not a popular message in the world today, but that's Bible, you know, that they should be keepers at home, that they should learn to love their husbands and their children. You know, that's the things that we could be fo focusing on as single people, you know, and praying and seeking a spouse. And going out there and finding them. And you know what? As I've heard said, and I believe it, I, and, I, and I've been there, I know what it's like to go years wondering if you're ever going to have somebody, and, and eventually they kind of come out of the blue. That at least that's the way it was in my experience. But I believe this, that there's a lid for every pot. I believe that. That if you're faithful to God, and that if you're, if you're uh, uh, you know, living for the Lord, that you know, God will provide that spouse in time. You know, it might not come when we want it, but, it, you know, I believe that if we seek it and we're preparing ourselves, God will provide if we ask. <clears throat> the Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. You know, that, it's a blessing. You know, it's a blessing to be able to meet that need, to share that with somebody 
and to have that for, for your whole life and, and to develop that relationship even beyond just the physical to where you, 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 and so on and so forth. But what does the rest of this verse say? But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. He said he will judge. It's not a maybe. It's not a gray area where, well, maybe if I commit a fornication, if I go around and be a whoremonger, I might get away with it. No, God will judge. And that's why we need to preach this. That's why this is why we need to keep these things in front of us because of the severe consequences that come upon us physically and spiritually. You know, you might be able to avoid some of the physical ones, but God will judge. You know, and if we choose to just disregard God, disregard the warnings of Scripture, you know, disregard God's method of, of satisfying these natural impulses, we will suffer punishment. And, you know, that punishment is going to be carried out, you know, it, through circumstances in our life, but most certainly in any Bible-believing church that actually practices what the Bible teaches, that punishment will be carried out through the form of local church discipline, of being put out of the body. And to what end? So that you'll get right, Okay. So that's the message this morning. Get right or get out. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, again, thank you for the Bible. Lord, thank you for the many warnings. Thank you for, uh, Lord, not sugarcoating things for us, but looking uh, upon, um, Lord, our lives and and speaking very plainly about them and and warning us of the dangers that are out there. And, Lord, not only that, but also providing us a way to escape, Lord, every temptation that we have. Lord, if we would just seek you, Lord, you'd help us to overcome that there's no com- uh, temptation that has uh, taken us, but as such as is common to man. And Lord, help uh, all of us to, to be faithful to our spouses, and Lord, those that are not married, to be faithful to you, and, and, and Lord, to keep ourselves in holiness, Lord. And I pray that you would just uh, let not, let, not let these sins be once named among us. We pray and ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, thanks for coming. We are dismissed.